Hello and welcome to the Renaissance English History Podcast, Tudor Minute, your mostly daily dose of all things related to medieval and Renaissance England. So today I'm going to talk for a minute about the dissolution of the monasteries. And I say that with a laugh because the idea of talking for a minute about the dissolution of the monasteries is really quite humorous because you really need years and years and years and years to talk about the dissolution of the monasteries. But this way, if you're ever at a trivia night and somebody says, hey, do you know about the dissolution of the monasteries? You can say, why, yes, I do, because I saw it in a Tudor minute. And I'm sure we'll talk more about it as time goes on. But so the basic idea of what the dissolution of the monasteries was, Henry VIII, when he wanted to get divorced from Catherine of Aragon, what Thomas Cromwell, his attorney who was helping him figure out a way to get away from the Pope, who hadn't granted his divorce yet. Cromwell's kind of workaround that he said at the time was that Henry actually was the head of the Church of England. The Pope didn't have jurisdiction in the Church of England. It was actually Henry as the king who was the head of the Church of England. They passed a law called the Act of Supremacy. So that meant that Henry didn't actually have to wait until the Pope granted him an annulment with his marriage to Catherine before he could just go ahead and marry Anne Boleyn. And that is actually why a lot of Catholics never saw the divorce, they never accepted the divorce from Catherine of Aragon because the Pope never granted it. But what Cromwell said was, hey, the Pope doesn't have jurisdiction here. The Pope is in Rome. Why is he trying to say stuff about what the English monarch can do? It's it's the church in England. The king is the head of the church in England. So Parliament, Parliament passed the Act of Supremacy and that's what allowed Henry to, to go ahead and marry Anne in England. Um, as part of that, Cromwell saw this great way to kind of ingratiate himself with Henry. And he realized that the church was the biggest landowner in England. At the time, about over, over about 15,000 people, were actually one in 50 men, were in a religious house of some sort. So it was a, a huge part of life for people. And the monasteries provided um, hospitality, and by that it also included like care for the sick, hospitals, as well as places for pilgrims to stay, places for people to stay, education. So it wasn't just this idea of monks being lazy, um, in their monasteries and getting fat off of the land. Um, you know, monks and nuns were actually doing a fair amount of good work, and I say that as a Protestant. Um, but it, it part of why there is that um, kind of stereotype is because of the disillusion. So what Cromwell did was... There's a plane. What Cromwell did was send people, men, all around to... Um, oh, it's a train send people all around England um, to the various monastic houses and document all the things they're doing wrong, all of the sexual misconduct, all of the financial misconduct, all, all of re everything like that, to make a case for dissolving them. And over 900 monasteries and convents were basically taken back into royal hands, were dissolved. Some of the monks and nuns were given pensions. Some of them were moved into other houses that were still kept open. Um, but basically the lands were seized and Henry was able to actually sell them off to nobles who wanted to increase their land holdings. By that point, England was becoming really crowded and they were kind of running out of land for nobles to be able to buy. So nobles would go ahead and buy some of the land at kind of dirt cheap prices. And the dissolution is actually what raised a lot of money for Henry to be able to go to war in France um, in the 1540s. So basically when people refer to the dissolution of the monasteries, they refer to this period when Cromwell was sending people around to the monastic houses, um, to the convents, uh, to the monasteries and documenting all of the things that they thought that the monks and nuns were doing wrong and making a case to have their houses dissolved. And over 12,000 
monks and nuns kind of lost their jobs, um, had their houses dissolved. And like I said, some were given pensions, some were moved to different houses. Um, and, you know, some just had to fend for themselves. There wasn't social security, unemployment at the time. Um, so some had to kind of fend for themselves. And this raised so much money, being able to sell off the lands. And then, of course, it, it was um, an issue when Mary came back, when Queen Mary came back to... Henry's first daughter by Catherine of Aragon because she was a Catholic and wanted to reconcile with Rome. And so what was going to happen to all of this land um, if she actually reconciled with Rome was a question that um, a lot of the nobles had who had perhaps purchased land uh, from Henry VIII. And then, you know, they were seeing 10 years later the threat that, or 15 years later, the threat that maybe their land wouldn't still be there. Maybe they'd wasted their money because Mary was going to give it all back to the houses and restore them all, um, which she didn't want to do. She knew that that would cause a huge firestorm, and, and she didn't She didn't actually do that. Um, so that's kind of your brief history of the dissolution of the monasteries. And we'll talk more about this. I'm sure I'm going to do more episodes about the dissolution of the monasteries. It's a really interesting subject of the way that Cromwell was able to go to these places and make these cases for um, the impropriety and the bad behavior of the monks and nuns. And in so many ways that that is actually stuck with us um, today, the, the view of the naughty nun and the naughty monk getting getting fat, like I said, off of the, the work of others. And, um, and that really comes to us from Cromwell. And so with that, that's your tutor minute for the day. Went into five minutes, six minutes. Oh. To learn more about the Renaissance English History Podcast, you can go to http colon slash slash englandcast.com. That's E-N-G-L-A-N-D-C-A-S-T dot com or facebook.com slash englandcast. You can also subscribe to the Renaissance English History Podcast on iTunes or Stitcher or your podcast aggregator of choice. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.